Well, we're up to week five, and this is the, we're concluding our Assembly Required series, and I've thoroughly enjoyed preaching and, and listening to this um, series, and I hope that it's been something that's practical and, help, and can help you, and has helped you, and will help you in your relationships as well, because when you think about it, what are we? We're relational beings, aren't we? We're not meant to do life alone. We're meant to do life in family. It says in Scripture that God places the lonely in family, and you know, that's why it's so good that we've got a, a church family like this, that we're not doing life alone. We can encourage one another. But you know what? Even when you come into a place like this, you can still feel like you're doing life alone. Can I encourage you? Get involved in the life of the church. Because when you get involved is when you're the closest in there that we can help each other as iron sharpens iron. Now, what do you think about? You think the, the smooth river, river stones that are in the bottom of rivers get smooth because they're up close, rubbing against other rocks. And you know, if you want to be a bit smoother in life, come on, start serving, get involved, let people rub you up the wrong way so that they can take those rough edges off you. But uh, I, I want to tell you that we're, we're responsible for our life. And keep positioning yourself in a place where you don't have to do life alone because I tell you what, in this church here, you don't have to do life alone. Amen? Just turn the person you're and say, I'm glad you're sitting next to me and I'm glad you're wearing deodorant. But week five, and when it comes to our relationships, we've got some relationships that are easy, some relationships that take a bit more work. But can I tell you something? All of our relationships in life, we've always got to be intentional and keep applying the right ingredients so we can get the best out of those relationships. Now, when it comes to the relationships in, in our life, it's not about taking, it's about giving. And what is it? The principle is as we sow, we will receive in our life. And uh, so I just want to encourage you, keep working on our relationship, keep working on your marriages, keep working uh, on your work colleagues, every sphere of your life, keep working on those relationships. And because we, uh, this whole series was based on the pretty much a flat pack, which is we've all got that beautiful picture when we go to Ikea that we see what it can be, but when we get it, it's all in pieces. And what we're going to use the right tools to be able to build that into what it's meant to be. And that's the same in our relationship uh, Well, We've got this idea of what we want it to be, our marriages and our, our friends and all those different things. Now, we've got all the ingredients. We've got the tools through the Word of God. But we've got to keep working at it and building it, not giving up. Come and stop quitting and start building the life that you want to live in, in Jesus' name. Amen? So I just want to recap quickly uh, just over the last uh, four weeks what we've been talking about. In the, the first one week, we talked about putting God first. And now, if we want to have healthy relationships, we're going to continue to put God first in our life. Come on, if He's the center of our life, if we allow Him into our life, into, into every area of our life, it, it, it adds to our life, not takes away. So keep putting God first. God is the center. He's not part. God is the center of our life and our relationships. Amen? Uh, the second is alignment. We've got the power of alignment. Because many times our intentions and our impact don't line up which is we want a household that's peaceful, but when we walk in, we keep causing conflict and fights. We haven't, we're not lining up between our intentions and our impact. So we've got to use that tool of alignment, slow down, ask yourself some questions, process, so you can begin to make the right impact on the world that you want to live in. Then week three, we talk about doing the hard things. Many times we don't want to do the hard things. We, we don't like conflict. We just want to keep pushing things aside. But can I tell you something? We want to build healthy relationships do the hard things. And then week four, we talked about gratitude. Have we got any thankful people in this place this morning? Come on. And I just know that I can guarantee when we spoke about that, you'd have had a week where it would have been tested, which is you had an opportunity to be grateful or to be entitled. And I hope that you chose being grateful. And if you didn't, it's all right. You always got tomorrow. Get up, choose to be grateful. Amen. Because when we make mistakes, we don't stay down. We get up. We've got a gracious God that keeps giving us a hand up to be able to get up in Jesus' name. But today we want to talk, uh, conclude it. And I think that this tool I'm going to give us today, if, if we don't have this, we really can't activate any of the other tools. And what I want to talk about for a few moments is humility. Oh, geez, that's a painful word. Humility. Have you ever had a conflict or you've, or you've, you've had something go wrong and you're and you've been convicted that you just need to humble yourself and fix that situation, and it's like that humble pie that you've got to eat, it's not really nice to eat, but in the end, it's got a really good aftertaste when you humble yourself. And I just believe that this tool today, if we can apply it, 
my goodness, it's going to help your life begin to reach whole new levels in your life. Because I believe there's some areas of our life where we can live humble. But there's other areas where we're just digging our heels in. We're going, nah, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to do this. But can I tell you something? If you can apply this tool of humility, you can build something in your life that will exceed your expectations. But sometimes humility doesn't make sense. But when you apply it, in the end it does. So Proverbs 29, 23 in the Message Translation says this. Pride lands you flat on your face but humility prepares you for honor what a powerful proverb that we have there that pride living all about yourself and what you want and what i want and and just that way will always just land you flat on your face but as you live with humility it prepares you for a life of honor i don't know about you but i want to live an honorable life between before people and before god and in this scripture here it's saying hey we're going to live with pride in the center, we're going to continually fall short, fall on our face, making fools of ourselves. But if we can humble ourselves, we're preparing ourselves for something great in our life. See, what pride does is it destroys intimacy. See, in your relational world, if you're going to take pride into it, it will destroy the relationship. If you take pride into your marriage, it destroys a marriage. But if you can take humility, the attitude of humility into relationships, it unlocks Health. Healthy relationships are birthed out of humility, not out of pride. See, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. Humility is about thinking less about yourself. Well, in our country, we can't think about ourselves too much. Man, the nation that we live in, we are very self-driven, all about us and how we feel and how we've been mistreated. And, 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 and that's very strong in our Australian culture. But that's not what a kingdom culture is. A kingdom culture means that we humble ourselves before God and we let God promote us and to take us to places that we've never been. So we've got to stop thinking, not think less of ourselves, but think less about ourselves. See, because you know what? An, An unhealthy spirit, an unhealthy life is very inward focused. Now, who here has ever had the great joy of smashing your shin into something? Oh, it's a great joy. You feel very alive, don't you? Now, I don't know about you, but when I hit my shin, I've done it a few times, walking behind a car and you walk into the tow ball or tow bar or something like that. I don't go, man, I want to bless somebody right now. I don't go, I just want to just praise Jesus right now. I'm hurting, so all my attention is focused on where I'm hurting, where there's no health. You know, if we live unhealthy lives... That's how we live, focused on the pain. When we've got to learn to let God heal us and go on that journey so that we can be outward focused, so that we can live humbly and be a blessing to those around us. Uh, 1 Peter 5 verse 5 says this. uh, Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Now listen to this powerful truth. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Don't you just wish that some verses weren't in the Bible? Just take that one out. We don't want to humble. Who wants to do that? But here it's saying God resists the proud, the ones that just think about themselves and all about them, but gives grace to the humble, the ones that are willing to humble themselves and be a blessing to those around them. You know, if you want more of God's grace in your life, more of his unmerited favor, come and begin to live humbly. If you want more of God's grace in your relational world, in your marriage, come and apply humility. Get rid of pride. Because pride will always be seeking. It's like, no, what I want. And it's such a burning force within many people. But we've got to learn to surrender that to God and choose humility. Clothe yourself with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Come on, healthy relationships. Now, I think a great example in Scripture of a healthy relationship is in a healthy relationship is in Ecclesiastes four verse twelve, and it says this: A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Can when we're doing life alone, we can easily be taken out, but when we have 
doing life together. We can stand back to back and we can what? Conquer. Now, when, when I'm talking to people that are having problems in their marriages, they've got this verse confused. They're not standing back to back fighting to conquer together. They're facing front to front, attacking each other, trying to conquer each other. And it's not how Scripture's not where God intended it to be. Can you think as a church, for us to be powerful and to be all that God's called us to be, it's about us standing back to back and fighting so we can conquer what God wants us to conquer. But if, we, if we're always facing each other and conflicting and having arguments, all we're doing is just destroying ourselves. Come on, let's never fall into that attitude. Because you've got to understand something, that God has anointed me to lead this church. If you like it or not, if you think that I'm qualified or not, God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. Those that are willing to stand up and say, hey, I'm willing to make a difference. I'm willing to say yes to Jesus. You know, when it comes to leading a church, people won't agree with me sometimes. That's leadership. If we all agreed, no one's leading the ship. You got to understand that. So come on, let's continue. I'm not saying anything's wrong, but let's never fall into letting pride creep in that causes us to stand and, and face each other. But let's stand back to back and continue to fight back against what the enemy's trying to do. And what does it say? A three-braided cord's even better. Which is, we can accomplish much by ourselves, but we'll accomplish heaps more when Jesus is in, entwined in it all. And I'll tell you something, Jesus is, he is, he, he's leading this church. It's all about him. He's the center of it all. Amen? So God resists the prayer, gives grace to the humble. See, living humble will cause you to do things you don't understand. Living humble will cause you to do things you don't understand, which in result will cause you to live your life to its fullest potential. You've got to just, just think about this for a moment. It took me a while to, when I was studying this to get this in my spirit. That living humble will cause us to do things we don't understand, but in return, it will cause us to live our life to its fullest potential. Luke 5, verse 4 and 7 would be the, the best way to explain uh, this, this attitude. It says this. This is Jesus says, When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, We worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But this is the powerful part. But if you say so, I will let down my nets again. And this time their nets were so full of fish they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners uh, uh, in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish on the verge of sinking. Now you've got to understand, imagine if pride was what controlled Simon's life. Jesus says, hey, go out a bit deeper and cast your nets. I'm a master fisherman. I've been out all night. I know what I'm doing. You don't know what you're talking about. I know what I'm talking about. But what did he say? He humbled himself. But if you say so, I will do it. I don't understand, Jesus, why you're telling me to do this. But if you say so, I'm going to humble myself and do it. And what happens when he does it? His boat reaches its full potential. He calls out to others and they begin to reach their full potential. So you've got to understand something that many times when it comes to God, when he tells us to step out and to do something, we don't understand it. Why would I do that for? But if we can, we think we know better. I've got a better plan. But if we can humble ourselves before God and say, how am I just going to trust what you say? If you say so, I'll do it. It causes our life to begin to reach its fullest potential. Don't let your lack of understanding rob you of the fullness that God wants to do in your life. Live humbly and see what he will do. On the other side of what we don't understand, God has so much blessing for us. But if you say so, come on, we'll humbly receive God's blessings for our life. Amen. See what? God's doing something. Amen. I just want to go through for a little bit this, this morning, Philippians 2, verse 3 and 11. And I want to just go through, and in this scripture, it gives us some amazing pictures and some amazing phrases about humility. And I want to go through this, and I'm not saying this to condemn you and say you're not a humble person. I'm just going to ask the Holy Spirit, and you should be as well, that 
if there's some areas in your life that need adjustment, just bring adjustment. Begin to live humbly. But they don't deserve it. I don't understand how God can do it. Hey, on the other side of you not understanding, being obedient to God, living humble, God can do something amazing. It starts off and says this. Don't be selfish. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Don't be selfish, which means don't be self-focused. I'm not saying we don't look after ourselves. We've got to look after what God gives us. We're good uh, stewards of what he's blessed us with. But we've got to be stop being so self-focused and realize that we've got to be God-focused in what he wants to do through our life. Because as we keep saying yes and humbly saying yes to God, we become that, that river of blessing where we can, he can pour in and he'll get it through us. But if God can't get it through us, he's going to stop giving it to us. You've got to understand that. So humility, it's, it's not self-focused. You even think about evangelism. That we're all called to be people that share our faith go and tell people about the good news of Jesus. You know that the reason why many of us struggle and don't do it is because we're worried that people are going to reject us and what they're going to think about us. See, that's a prideful attitude, not a humble attitude. Because evangelism isn't about us. It's about that person coming to know Jesus so that they can live to their fullest potential as well. So humility, don't be self-focused. And it says this, don't try to impress others. You know what? Impressing others can be very dangerous. And I can guarantee everybody here has a story of when they've said, hey, watch this. And it hasn't turned out the way that you thought it would turn out. So be careful living the life of impressing others. But you know what? I, I pull a point out of this is that humility values others. Instead of trying to impress and get everybody to look at you, value others and what God's doing in their life. You know, I see that. I know I've got gifts and I've got talents and I've got all that just like you. And I can just sit there and I can just value myself. But I don't think it's very helpful. I do value myself, but I also value people and what God has placed in their life and pulling the best out of them. The reason why I challenge people, the reason why I get around and I try to stir people up to go to greater levels, it's because I value people. And I know that we've got to stop settling for the status quo. God has so much more for you. Valuing. Humility values others. We keep reading on. It says this, be humble. Think of, thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look, only, don't look out only to your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Humility is interested in others. Instead of just living interesting, live interested in people's lives. Being humble. Realizing that it's not all about us and, and our comfort, but it's about being a blessing, being interested in others. You know, I'm going to say something right now, and I want you to take this with so much grace because I'm a very gracious person. You know, if we're interested in others, we come to church early. Oh, jeez, he went there. I always got told if I'm five minutes early to church, I'm late. Because you know what, I really believe that sometimes we think, oh no, I, don't, I won't go to church on time. I know that sometimes things come up and we've got kids, whatever it is, but it's fine. But I'm saying some people have created a habit of, I don't want to go to church because I don't want to be the first one there. It could be a bit this, could be a bit that. What's speaking? Is that humility or is that pride? Oh, geez, getting a bit, going a bit too deep, I'm sorry. Because if Jesus was physically here, you wouldn't leave. I mean, Jesus is here. When Jesus is in the house, the house is full. Okay, and we've got to create a culture where, men we're excited, we're expectant, we're coming early, we're believing, we're interested in other people because it's not about just us walking in about us, but when we come to church early, we're setting an atmosphere for people to come into church and they're seeing a place that's alive and vibrant, people that care about the gathering of the saints. So come on, let's gather together. Let's be five minutes early at least. Be interested in others. You know, I can come a bit earlier. I can encourage somebody. We can do that. I feel like I'm getting burnt right now by some people, but it's all right. <laughs> it says this, You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. Now, you've got to think about that. Jesus set 
the example for us and how we can live our life. He was God, but he set aside all of his privileges and he lived just like how we live. He had to live dependent on God and on the Holy Spirit, just like we have to live. And I think many times we think, oh no, that's God. he was God, but no, he, he put aside all of his privileges and he lived a way that we can live. So what Jesus can do, we can do. But I see here what, that, what, what he did is that he sacrificed. He sacrificed what was important for something that was even more important. And I think humility, it sacrifices. And in, in the culture that we live in, sacrifice, we, some people can think straight away of Old Testament and killing goats and blood and all that sort of stuff. Some people can think about sacrificing, not having to eat a meal or, or denying themselves. But, but if a sacrifice is giving up what's important. And I think humility, is, it's sacrificial. And you know what? For us as a church to reach our full potential, and we're on a journey. We're a great church, but we're not going to just stay the way that we are. We're, we're striving to be all that God's called us to be. Actually, not striving, walking in peace <laughs> in what God's called us to be. But for us to go to that next level, you know what it's going to take? Sacrifice. And sacrifice comes out of a humble spirit. Hey, I'm willing to give up what's important to see God's kingdom established here on earth. I'm going to give up a bit of my time or whatever it may be. But can I tell you something? Whatever you sow in the supernatural, whatever you sow into God, He will always pour back into your life. I haven't got time to do it. No, you sow and God gives you more time. I don't know how it happens, but He's a supernatural God. Come on, sacrifice helps us in this area. Then it says this, he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. What did he do? He says that he took the humble position of a slave. He served. Humility causes us to want to serve and just help in every area of our life. And I think sometimes if you come to church a lot, we just think serving is just like serving in church. But you know what? We're called to serve and love our community. We serve our families. We serve our neighborhoods. And we've got to understand a humble spirit, it serves. It's willing to pick up the towel instead of the title. It's, 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 it just wants to do something to be able to be a blessing to others. Come with humility. But you know what? The opposite to that is stingy. It doesn't want to give anything away. But let's choose to be humble because God gives us grace when we live humble. And then what we've got here says this. I'm right on time today too. Man, he's lucky. He might get an early mark today. <laughs> he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. What did Jesus do? He set an example of humility to us. He was submissive. Now, this is another word in our culture that sometimes we can cringe about, think submissive. I'm not, I'm not submitting to anybody. But you know what submissive is? It means sub means under, and missive is the mission. So Jesus come under the mission of what the Father had set for him to do. He was submissive, and, and a humble attitude becomes submissive, obedient to God. We've got to come under the mission. You know what? There's many people in our church that, man, they're, they're, they're with us. We're inspiring people to live for Jesus. People are under that. They're, they're, all, they're, they're working. They're doing all they can to inspire people to live for Jesus. They're submissive. They're under that. But then there's some people that struggle with it because maybe someone's abused your trust or someone's dominated over you and you're starting to think, oh, I can't do that. But can I tell you something? Being humble, stepping out, trusting God on the other side of that is a great reward and blessing as we've read before. So humility, it's submissive. Then I love how this verse ends. It says, therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor. Isn't it amazing that humility will always lead you to a place of honor? Therefore, God elevated him to a place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names. What is it? The name above all names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Come on. Come on, the Jesus that we serve. He's the name above every name. Come on, it says that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Come on, this God that we serve, the God that we humbly serve, He's a God that's working in us. And as we keep living a humble life, He'll always take us to places that we can never dream of. 
He honors us because humility sets us up for great blessing in our life and through our relationships. So we started off reading 1 Peter 5 verse 5. I want to read the next verse down, 1 Peter 5 verse 6. It says, Humble yourself therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Humble yourself before God's mighty hand. At the right time, he will lift you up in due time. See, pride wants you to do things in your time, but humility causes you to trust in God. And at his right time, in the due time, he lifts you up. He brings you away what you need. But it starts with living humbly. And it says, humble yourself. Because I love what people used to say, if you don't humble yourself, God will humble you and it's going to be worse. Humble yourself before under God. At the, right, at the due time, he will lift you up. At the due time, at the due time, at the right time, at just the right time, in his perfect timing, if we keep positioning ourselves, saying yes to him, living humbly, at the due time, he will bring something our way. See, pride will cause us to stop worshiping God. Pride will stop us from being obedient to God because pride worships and is obedient to itself only. So I want to encourage us that when we come and gather together, when we worship Jesus, when the Word of God's been preached, let's live humbly. Let's yes and amen the Word of God. What is it when we yes and amen the Word, we come into agreement with it, saying, God, I believe in your Word. Let it be done in my life. Come When we come and we worship Jesus, we lift up our holy hands. We don't lift up hands just because we're at a rock concert. No, we lift up our hands because it's an outward expression of what our heart is, surrendered to God. If I had a gun to your chest, your hands are going to be raised. Because you're surrendering. When we worship God, we surrender to you. And I just think that for us, as we continue to live humbly, it begins to throw hot coals or hot ash into the devil's face. Because he knew what pride did to him. So he doesn't like living humbly. He doesn't want us to live humbly. You know what? The devil, all he wants to do is to kill, steal, and destroy. Relationships with ourselves and relationship with God. But as we choose to live humbly, we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. At the due time, He lifts us up. So when we gather, let's yes, amen, let's worship like we've never worshipped before. Because it does something in, our, in the atmosphere, it does something in our life. And it shows the devil that we're gonna, not going to live our life following his example. But we're going to live our life following the example of Jesus Christ. Simon, when he cast out his, and Jesus told him to go out again and put his nets down, what was his response? But if you say so, I just wonder, I just think in this place this morning that there, there needs to be a, a shift, a decision in your life where you say, I'm not going to do it my own way anymore, but God, if you say so, I'm going to do it your way. In your relationships, in your marriage, in your families, oh, I'm doing it your own way. How's it turning out doing it your own way? Humble yourself, do it God's way. I don't understand why I have to forgive. I don't understand why I've got to let that go. I don't understand why I've got to reach out, but God, I'm going to humble myself and do it. And I know that as you do that, I'm going to see health begin to flow into my relationships. But if you say so. I even think that there's some people here and you're married and you're still trying to live like you're single and God's saying, hey, you need to let go of that. You're not a brother anymore. You're a husband. Or you're not, a wife, you're not, a, you're not one of the girls anymore. You're, you're, a, you're a wife. So I think sometimes every season of life, we've got to let go of things to step into the new season. And sometimes in our relational transitions, we want to keep things the same. But they change. And you've got to humble yourself. And I believe that Holy Spirit's going to talk to some people about that. Time to step into a new season, let go of some things cut some relationships off that are a bad influence. Cut some things off that are stopping you from causing Jesus to be the center of your life. And I'm not saying get rid of your spouse. That's not biblical at all. There is reasons to do that. and it's, There's biblical things in there. But I think that we've got to fight for marriages because marriages are important. I know that in um, Malachi it says that I mean, God, he doesn't like divorce. I'm not saying that if people have gone through that, I mean, it's, 
it's done, but let God do a work in you, heal you, restore you, so you can go into the next relationship whole and fighting together, back to back, not face to face, so you can conquer whatever comes your way. Amen.